It is a consulting company that Chris headed out, headed, and uh, it's wonderful. And I don't know whether Chris knows this part of the story. Years later, after Faith, I say Faith retired when he was she was 29 or something, and uh, after then she came back from Pennsylvania, went to the company, and one of his staff who was already then becoming a, you know, partner or something. And she felt so sorry for Faith and said, Faith, if you can't find a babysitter, I can find you one. Please do come back to work. We need you. And Faith told, I don't remember the person's name. Faith said, dear, you have your calling and I have my calling. And uh, so it has been a wonderful, the, as Sam said, the training that they have received under uh, Chris's leadership has gone a long way in all three of them. And now who, guess who invited Chris? Gifty did. I had no clue. And Gifty also worked, all three of them. Uh, Faith was a regular consultant and this too, I believe, they interned there. And so we are so thankful that, so when this morning I was sitting there and I see Chris coming with a big tray and along with Claire was uh, Deborah there. And initially I was confused, who is this person coming with a big tray of food? And then it took me a while, I figured it out that Chris was in fact carrying the tray that sister Deborah was bringing. And, and then I couldn't figure out who this was. And uh, he said, Chris Markov, I know Chris so well. So I'm so thankful, God is a good God. Everything that we do, there is nothing too little for the Lord. Every drop of water you give, every relationship that you build, we must pray the Lord, I want to do it as unto the Lord because people are observing you when you're not saying a word. Or in a moment of weakness is where Christ comes out. And that's a real Christ in you. And that real Christ must bring glory and honor to the Lord. Chris and Claire, you're so very welcome. Chris can speak for an hour without any preparation. I mean, that's what he has done all his life. Would you like to say a word? Come. God is very good. Amen. I can't tell you, Gifty, how blessed I feel to be here. God's timing is perfect. I needed to be with you today. I'm struggling. What sustains me is that I know I'm being sanctified by God Amen. to prepare me for glorification. Yeah. I'm blessed because I'm in touch with such a sinner that I am. Because my need for Christ is overwhelming. Some people might walk around thinking they're good. You don't need a savior then. 
Well, you're looking at a man who needs a savior. And I consider that a blessing. What is it about your family? I have six children, Claire and I. God is working on my family. But I aspire to have the depth of a relationship with Christ, not just for me, but for my six children. And I get scared with everything going on and having children that are not really deeply in the faith. That's why I admire you so much. From the very first moment I met you, and you always gave the acknowledgement to God for what was happening in your life with these three incredible, absolutely incredible children. And I know you didn't do it alone. <laughs> In fact, <laughs> I should be looking at you. <laughs> so you are a blessing to me. 25 years later, I'm here randomly. What, what did we hear from Jacob today? It's not random. So I thank you. I acknowledge you as important. This has been a tremendous blessing being with you all. And the children, these children. God has to be smiling right now. So thank you for welcoming us. All the glory goes to God. Amen. All of it. Yes. He arranged for everything. Amen. Everything. And rained the blessing of knowing this incredible family down on me. Undeservingly. You have, I admire you, and I aspire to be like you. Like Jesus. <laughs> so, thank you for the welcome. Amen. It's wonderful to be with you. Amen. 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 Please Thank you, Chris and Claire, for coming. And uh, there's nothing like being honest before God and before the people of God and saying it from your heart. And I, we sense that sincerity and honesty that has come from your heart. We do not want to position anything here. We do not want to imposter anything here. We just want to be who we are before God and express from our hearts so that we can be helped. God wants every one of us. He wants every one of us here. So I'm very thankful for Anil for coming. And uh, yesterday, Bina and I had the chance to meet with uh, Mamta and Pragya. She doesn't understand all of English, so I'm going to say it in Hindi. Aap hai. Isse bhi jala hum sab or Yeshu Ap Prabhu Ap Ko Ap Kelie, how do you say purpose? Udesh, purpose hai, right? Ap, the Lord has a purpose for you. That's why you're here. Ye mene pehla bola tha. Ki the Lord has a purpose. He wants your heart. And Prage, He wants your heart too. We had a wonderful time sharing the word with her last night. And the Lord is going to do the work in your life. Uh, so God is going to do something for you. So let's pray for her, right? Let's pray for her and the daughter. I believe the Lord is going to do something in their lives. Good to see everybody else. Um, 
I mentioned the Hindu family earlier because I wanted to pray for them. God is going to do something in their life as well. We'll, we'll mention that later. But I want to give um, time now to Ashish to share the word, and then we will go from there. So Ashish, come on up. Uh, good morning. Yeah, good morning, church. Uh, I think uh, as Sam was sharing in a, uh, uh, like about his testimony, I, I can always resonate with him like the, uh, uh, the uh, because uh, Bab Uncle believes in Timothy chapter one, uh, in First Timothy, where he, Paul was exhorting Timothy that you should be prepared in season or out of season. <laughs> so, Bamukul told me like to share the word and I like I had a very nice excuse because I generally control the audio video. I was like, Uncle, today Jeremy is not here. I have to take care of that. But Uncle was like, no, nope, you have to go ahead, share something, <laughs> at least share your testimony. And uh, and uh, and it's very interesting that it's the similar like uh, uh, I think the I think even the last year. Uh, Babu uncle was leading the Bible study. Uncle told like, I'm going for a week for a Philadelphia. Why don't you step in and uh, just fill in for the Bible study? And uh, it's interesting that it's been over a year. I'm still. <laughs> yeah. So so in that way, like, yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, and I thank God for like these opportunities. Uh, <laughs> Uh, uh, like what Bob Uncle just push in and uh, gives that to share. And uh, I would say like, uh, uh, so Uncle, give me a little uh, provision, like what you can do is like you can share your testimony and share what's in your heart. So probably, uh, uh, so that's what I was thinking about sharing a little bit about what's going on in our lives, uh, especially like uh, now, uh, uh, primarily like mini has been like uh, starting uh, basically starting uh, august so she's been also involved in formally involved in the crew uh, uh, ministry in campus in university of maryland and like so now it's more formal i think the only difference is that she was doing whatever she was doing even before when she was volunteering now she has like a bunch of meetings like where they're giving her a lot of uh, training material and also uh, uh, directions uh, and uh, last week, uh, uh, I think we had a visitor uh, uh, coming uh, from the crew and uh, the mentor or the mini with whom she's working. Uh, so she described her ministry as a playground ministry uh, because like we, we, live, uh, we live in a student complex and uh, we have two little children. So uh, the most of the people mini has been meeting is while standing in the playground and there will be a other mom or other uh, parent would be coming with a kid and then they will sl slowly talk to each other and uh, and it's been interesting that we like uh, like we've been hosting a bible study in at, at our home and like at least two of the uh, families just came in just because they had a kid they just talked and oh you are a christian i am a christian and like they, they were believers and even last week uh, it was uh, interesting like there was one jordanian family like they just moved in in Maryland, maybe this semester. They just came in and like, at least, I, I, I don't think they are believers, but at least sort of an introduction to the faith. Uh, and seeing a lot of things happening uh, uh, in, the, in the life, like even though we are seeing the same student apartment. And uh, I was thinking on, on the other side of my own uh, self about like, I've been, uh, I, like I, I, being in the University of Maryland, although now almost like, 10 years uh, uh, because uh, and I've been sort of part of the church ICF also been 10 years so this would be my 11th year running uh, so I joined as a PhD student uh, then uh, then uh, during the transition uh, after PhD I've joined at the same group as a postdoc and I've been working there uh, but I was just wondering like because in in like just to move ahead uh, I think in career like it's good to just move ahead and but I feel like sort of stuck in the situation and uh, and I, in the meanwhile I'm also seeing like God working in this bits and pieces in the other parts like 
like I like I be, I wanting like to maybe like maybe next step like in life or like in the career, uh, and maybe like a better accommodation or something. But God has been still using very interestingly in whatever uh, God has been given to us, and uh, that's been like a very uh, I would say like. Uh, a uh, sense of a uh, very uh, like uh, th that's something like I'm trying to understand like how God has been working in the sense of uh, the, He's been blessing. He's been blessing wonderfully in terms of like reaching out to people like through we like we are just hosting, but it's sort of like a place where like the crew, um, the the people from the the crew ministry, they can have at least some place to like come in, sit and talk to the students, and also like the Bible study like. It's more of like every Tuesday, I'm like, oh, I have to study for the Bible study and like, oh, I have to come, come, come prepare. But I can see like uh, week after week, like at least that time, uh, I can say to everybody, like to my kids, like, okay, I have to like, I have to study the word, I have to study the Bible. And that gives a time, like, I feel like I have learned a lot, like just to prepare, like just for 15 minutes and uh, to share the word and, and in, 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 the, in the Bible study, I'm more uh, comfortable because that I'm not facing the people. I'm facing just the computer. Everybody's screen is off, so I, I only have to see Babu Uncle. And, <laughs> and the second part is like, I just have to share a little bit and uh, Babu Uncle puts in. Uh, and, but definitely I, I can see that it has been a blessing. Uh, especially like we've been studying uh, the book of Deuteronomy and we've been on the chapter 28 for like almost like a month now. But uh, but I would say like, I think I probably I'll start with like what I really learned from that particular chapter was the fact that uh, the the first time, like uh, there are like multiple things that sort of I really learned from Deuteronomy chapter 28 uh, if for the context. Deuteronomy chapter 28 describes the, uh, it's actually like almost 66 verses and first 14 verses talks about the blessings of obedience in the Mosaic covenant. And the rest 50 verses talks about the curses in disobedience in the Mosaic covenant. And it's this particular chapter, I believe is slightly can be like, confusing like as Bob, as Joji uncle shared like at the starting like he t told about like blessings if you have blessings in your life you'd be thinking you're doing what god's will is if you have something which is not the blessing i won't say the curse not the blessing and which looks similar to a curse you think like you, you have curses in curses in your life and uh, if uh, that's the question like sort of like i put it in the group also uh, that uh, like just to think about it like is <laughs> think about it is about uh, uh, about like how to differentiate the sufferings that is like not to fall into the trap of like if everything is going good you're telling everything in my life is good and everything is blessing and something is going bad you start beating yourself or you start thinking oh this may be a curse from god and you have to like fix something but I, I'll, I'll probably touch this topic a little later, but I think the one important thing that I really learned, uh, or like that really like sort of like dawned on me when I was preparing for especially this chapter, was the fact that I was comparing between, uh, like the chapter 28 is about the Mosaic Covenant. We, we talk about, uh, in the New Testament, it is described as the law, and we compare it with what Jesus did in the New Testament and how the grace has redeemed us. And uh, so in, in that perspective, like I think the most of the time that falls from the plate is the, the fact is like, we think like the Old Testament was all about obedience and disobedience. New Testament is about grace, so there's no need of obedience. So that like was like, it's not like said, but probably the importance is uh, was about obedience in the Old Testament of getting right with God. And in the New Testament, it is telling that, okay, the Old Testament was just showing you that it is impossible. And the New Testament is telling or that by 
by Jesus' blood and by Jesus' righteousness or Jesus' obedience, we are standing as the right person in front of God. But that doesn't take away the fact of obedience because the I think the interesting part was like what we were lacking in the Old Testament of obedience to God was that we had to like strive ourselves, like we had to put in a lot of effort to obey. Like if it's more of, uh, I think sometimes like being getting be, like being parents gives a glimpse of it. Like we tell, um, like I think with Joshua it's very interesting. If you tell him don't do this, he will like stand like that. Don't and shout on him, he won't move. But if you like tell him can you help me to do this? Then probably he does that. So the thing is like the obedience is still like for a young, even a young kid is not that easy. So by default, even in the Old Testament, that is I think the whole Old Testament Mosaic law was just pointing out that obedience by your strength is impossible. But in the New Testament or in the New Covenant, the, the obedience that been talking about is that uh, is by the is the point of that we uh, share or uh, most of us uh, uh, like when we when some person comes in the lord for the first time we always share from uh, galatians chapter 2 uh, i think it's verse 17 i believe uh, uh, Yeah, yeah, the verse 20, yeah. So the Galatians, uh, Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, which says that I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. Amen. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Uh, I think maybe like just one quick, I just uh, had a very interesting, like if you if you open this one in KJB, there's a very interesting uh, uh, modification. Um, that, uh, yeah. Yeah, so, so the important modification, like uh, uh, it seems like in, uh, in, in the, in the Greek, there is no proposition in front of the word faith of. So if you see here, it is faith of, of the Son of Christ. And in NIV, the translators have translated into faith in the Son of God. So it's a very interesting uh, presentation, which can like in English, it makes a lot more difference because the fact that in the second, in the NIV, it may seem like still it is, you have to put your faith and in KJV is telling like, even that is not yours. You can just stand by the faith of Jesus. And, uh, but the point, what I was telling was like the new covenant is that we are not given just the righteousness of Christ, but he also like provides all the, he enables us. He enables us to obey. And that's why the obedience is still a requirement in the sense of like, God is not telling like, you can do whatever you want. But he's telling that, like, you can uh, obey because I have given you the strength to obey. And that is sort of like a liberating sentence. Like, if I, somebody says that, obey the Lord or love the Lord with all your heart. Now you're not like, okay, like with your clinching fist, like, I have to love the Lord. But, no, but now it is more of like, you have the strength, you have the power of God, or power of Christ to obey him, power of Christ to love him. And that's sort of like, was that was sort of like it like like, uh, like as i was preparing for deuteronomy 28 like it like it just came up and like i didn't know like when because sometimes it's like somebody asks us to like obey and again like probably like as a new covenant in the new covenant we have to make a choice of like like we, in the new covenant too the one thing that is there is like we still have our own flesh it is not that probably we are completely independent like when even though we are a new creation it doesn't mean that we won't sin we have our own flesh uh, which is constantly in competition with what or competition is a nice word so i think the word would be war with the spirit of god uh, as to 
uh, uh, like the, yeah, to, to, to do what is by our own strength. Like we can try to strive to be a Christian by our own strength, obey by our own strength, and which is impossible. And, uh, and that's something like, but, but, the, but, the, but the main important part was like that obedience is still, like it's more of like he enabled us to obey was something that dawned, I don't know, <laughs> I have like read, I may have like read a lot in the New Testament, heard a lot of sermons, but like that preparing for that particular uh, chapter was sort of like a dawn, uh, like to me, like, oh, wow, that is pro so profound. And uh, uh, if I, I was trying to read, uh, but I'm like very, read a book. Uh, it's, I think it's a pretty good book. It's from Andrew Murray, The School of Obedience. Mm -hmm. And it's a very, like I, like, I think with me, the problem is like, if I start reading a book, I fall asleep fast, so I haven't <laughs> finished it. <laughs> but like, I think that particular Andrew Murray is a very, like his, I think I have read some of his sermons. It's very rich. Like he was a preacher in 1920s or 19, early 1900s from South Africa, but his uh, revelation in the word is so profound. But even that, that I think that's the, uh, like that gives that, uh, uh, like the, the, the importance or the weightage on both how to stand on grace and how to be obedient unto God. Uh, so that has been something that, uh, was sort of like in my heart about like what I actually learned from uh, uh, the, uh, like from at least being like, uh, I won't say like, uh, like I would, uh, in that way, like I always like appreciate or like I'm thankful for God for these opportunities that come, which like, I mean like in the whole book of Deuteronomy, like as I was reading it, it's been such, uh, uh, like a revelation, some new revelations, even to me in the sense, in the sense of we, we like to just being focusing only on the Old Testament or just in the New Testament, we t tend to look down what the Old Testament and uh, and I still remember like as a testimony, like I think I have shared it before too, but about like there was a case, I think uh, that even I shared even in our community group was the fact that uh, by, by, by mistake uh, or like by reading it by myself, like uh, I think I, I really thank David for that discussion with David Bravo for the, this. We have two Davids today, so I have to be specific. <laughs> David Bravo with the discussion about that. We tend to again think like even in the older Testament, it was by following the law that you were accepted. But the interesting thing was it was always from the old to the new, it always by you by faith. And that sort of like, like small, these kind of like I don't know it's I don't know it feels good but it's more of like a clarity gives more uh, like I think I think it's good <laughs> but uh, but the point and it 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 tends to uh, change the confusion like it changed to like I think that's the one like uh, probably like it, that I've been struggling like with how to bring about the difference between what Deuteronomy chapter twenty eight the blessings and the curse how to talk about it, how to take it. Like we, we tend to like get totally scared by the list of curses that was mentioned, like 44 verses of curses. And it's all about destruction and everything. But, but like, I, I'm again, try, like uh, that's the question that I just posted in, in the whole group, like just to think about it, how to take and not to beat yourself up uh, and putting it to my own testimony in the sense of like now I've been struggling with sometimes like, okay, it's not fruitful in my own work. Like I'm struggling with my work. I know there have been mistakes from my own side, but, uh, but like, but, but the question is how to, uh, handle the, like handle this kind of a storm or handle this kind of a failure. Like as George Uncle started in the initial, uh, part about the storm in life about like Jonah and the story of Jonah, it was his mistake. But if you take the case of David, it was not his mistake. Like the, the worst part was, or the, I think the interesting part was David was telling, or like he was taking care of sheep. He was doing his own business. His dad also didn't recognize he had a like eight son. He was chilling out, making his songs. He was fighting the lions and the bears by himself. And this guy, old guy comes, 
he's uh, uh, pretty upset about the fact that his first choice was bad. Uh, this old guy, Samuel, his first choice of making Saul the king was bad. And he comes into the life of David. He anoints him as a king. He's been anointed by the spirit. And then the trouble starts. And like the trouble is that now he is uh, like he got a chance to fight Goliath and all of a sudden he's put to the fame. And now the king of Israel is running behind his life. And, uh, and I'm like sort of amazed by his, uh, some of the Psalms that I, I think what he has written in the sense of, uh, like it's very, con like sometimes, like, I, like probably I won't judge that much, but I think maybe like his spiritual life was more stronger when he was in a wilderness than he was a king. Uh, I don't know. I don't want to judge with that, but I think the, maybe like uh, one of the Psalms uh, that I want to read uh, was that how he was tackling his own struggles, his own uh, unwanted attention, unwanted running, running from the king uh, for whom like he won so much war. He actually fought so much war. And uh, this is Psalm 63. Uh, which, uh, I think, uh, I think the, it's good to read verses one to eight. That's pretty profound. Uh, I think it's very good for just to read. Uh, it's Psalm 63 verse one to eight. Uh, and just a context behind this particular Psalm. This is a Psalm. Uh, I think if you, in, in most of the, Bible, like the introduction given is like when he was in the desert of Judah. And the part was that again, like there was, I think I was trying to understand like which year, uh, time period, but I think most of the authors are not very clear. There's sometimes it may be when he was running from Saul, or it can also be the fact that he was running from his son, Absalom. So it can be one of them, but, but the thing was like, you have been chased, you have been like you have been promised of being the king of Israel or you are, or you were a king of Israel. And then David in this storm, he talks about it. Oh God, you are my God. Honestly, I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My body longs for you in the dry and weary land where there is no water. Uh, verse two, I have seen you in the sanctuary and beheld your power and your glory. Verse three, because your love is better than life, my lips will glorify you. Verse four says, I will praise you as long as I live. And in your name, I will lift up my hands. My soul will be satisfied with the richest of the foods. With the singing lips, my mouth will praise you. On my bed, I remember you. I think of you through the watches of the night because you are my help. I sing in the shadow of your wings. My soul clings for you. Your right hand upholds me. Um, I think the, maybe like I'm, I'm, I'm not planning to have any <laughs> talk, but I think this was something like I was really appreciative of the fact of like how David in the midst of his storm, he's not like, uh, like he has full right to blame. Like it's not like I was having a chill life. I was chilling out in the field, <laughs> no problem. <laughs> and like now I'm running, like I don't have probably food. Uh, like, or just in the other case, you can think about Absalom, like, oh, my own son is running behind me, trying to kill me. Uh, but I think the one verse, I think I was a little bit trying to read more about it. One of the verses that I think what commentary from the Spurgeon that was Charles Spurgeon, he mentioned that in the period of uh, the storm. Either you can praise in the, even in the desert, or the desert can come into your spiritual life. Yeah. So, uh, so I think that sort of like sort of clicked me a little bit, like about like this, like how important it is to be rooted in, yeah. in the in the in the word and in his uh, promises in his. Like just to see him uh, in the sense of who he is, that he is a benevolent father, which he is, because the word that the psalm that he starts here, he says, "Oh God, you are my God." Yeah. 
like the personal relationship and he's holding on to it. He's like circumstances are telling something else, but he's still holding on to it. And uh, this was something that sort of like it's a prayer for my own self, especially like the struggle of not to blame God for even though it's my mistake, like sometimes I get into this, oh God, you're God, you could have stopped that problem, <laughs> uh, stopped that mistake. Uh, but uh, I think I think maybe or maybe just a prayer for like just to be rooted in the word, not to like get swirled by the circumstances. Uh, I think it's just a prayer for me and for all of us. Thank you. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Ashish touched on something that is, um, I think we should, uh, for a long time, the modern church has been uh, confused with, I would say, the grace versus law, right? And when we look, three quarters of the Bible is Old Testament. Three quarters of the Bible is Old Testament. And yet, we can look at Old Testament and we see all kinds of laws. And Ashish was talking about, if you follow the law, there's blessing. If you don't follow the law, there's curses. And the mindset of human beings is still like that. Today, modern church will say, including us, when I say modern church, I'm talking about us. We would say that, um, <clears throat> or rather, I would say the, this grace versus law is being used in so many different ways. For example, grace is used liberally by people who wants to commit sin and use it as an opportunity, as an excuse for sin. God's grace is there. It covers my, all my sin, which is true. But how it is being taken is because we don't want to be legalistic. We don't follow the Old Testament. And therefore, there is grace and there is gives you opportunity and liberty to do what you want to do that's coming under grace. Now, on the other hand, we have a whole bunch of legalistic people who follow certain things and are very dogmatic about following those things, become legalistic, and they've become, they're good with those things that they follow, but they also are very good Pharisees. We can be like that, and we are being like that. We have been like that in many ways. We judge another person based on what we think that I'm following a certain law, grace versus law. Now, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 6, if you look at that, as Ashish was sharing, he was talking about, can you read, can somebody read that 10, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 6? Or you can bring it up either ways. Now, these things were examples. With the intent, we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Right. These things were brought to us as? Examples. He's talking about the Old Testament. There's a connection. He's talking about the Old Testament. These things, things that were shown in the three quarters of the Bible is Old Testament. These things are what? Examples. I know that's an even more specific scripture in Colossians chapter 2, verse 16 and 17, if you can pull that. 17 talks about shadow of things to come. If you take King James, it's very clear, uh, the word shadow. <laughs> So, okay. right. the body is of Christ. Let no one judge you. So there's a whole thing that goes before that scripture. Let no one judge you about Sabbath, about New Moon Day, about your festivals, about what you eat, what you drink. No one judge you, which is all according to the Old Testament, because these things are what? A shadow. shadow. Now, I want you to hold on to that word shadow. These things are what? A shadow. Now, what is a shadow? Now, the sun out there, you see a shadow of the building. When you see the shadow, what are you seeing? You're only seeing the outline. How many times have you heard about the Old Testament? It's a shadow of what's the new. It's a shadow of what's the new. So when you are walking in the sun, I see my shadow. That's not the real thing. The real thing is who? Is me. The real thing, that's not the building, it's the shadow of the building. So when somebody, suppose a you know, young couple who was ready to get married, 
uh, they're living in different cities, what do they do? They keep a picture. See, those days there were the words, there was no, it's in the modern words, it will, you call it a photo, right? There's no photo that's those days. So that's why the, the word shadow is being used to imply about a shadow of something. If, if it was modern uh, day, uh, the scripture would have said, it's a picture of what the real thing is. So if two, two young couple who are love, in love with each other, living in different cities, what do they carry in their wallet? A picture of their loved one, a picture of something on their phone because they want to see that person, but it's only a picture. That's not a real person. So when do we, here's the thing I want us to understand what, what Ashish brought up. Here's the problem with law versus grace. The people who are occupied and preoccupied with the law are people who are looking at the picture. If you are preoccupied, who's the real thing? The real thing is Jesus who came and brought whole another meaning about those laws to be followed. It's higher than and greater than anything that was written in the law because you couldn't follow the law. And I'll get you a scripture where it confirms all of this. So if you don't have, if you're not preoccupied with the real thing, that means you're preoccupied with the picture. So the more you talk about laws, 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 you are more talking about, you're looking at the picture, you're not looking at the real thing, the real person, Jesus himself. So the Old Testament is a shadow of the real thing, Christ himself who came and completely brought a whole new revelation of what the Old Testament is. So all these things are a shadow. It's a picture of things to come. So it's perfectly normal for a person to have a picture of a person because that person is not there. In our homes, people carry, have pictures of the grandparents who have passed away because that person is not there. So if you hold the law so strongly that you're only talking about the law, and the shadow, that means the real person is not there in your life. If the real person is not there, is there, all of these won't matter. You'll be beyond these laws. Now, there are many such things that God brought laws in the Old Testament. We don't have time to cover all of these as Ashish covered a good bunch of it, but I want to take, <clears throat> I'll take a couple, the three big ones, which is being addressed, being followed even today, which applied only in the New Old Testament which is, number one is the Sabbath. The other one is tithing. Now, some of you will get offended if I say tithing is an Old Testament law, and it is true. We'll talk about that later, but I just want, I'll touch on Sabbath, which will give you, I'll just touch on Sabbath, which will give you uh, clarity on this grace versus law, and that will, then we can talk about tithing another time. There's a whole denomination today just based on Sabbath. The seventh day. They talk about seventh day. You have to follow it. Because why? God said, keep the Sabbath. So what exactly did God say to keep the Sabbath? So in Gen so I, I'll, I'll just touch on this Sabbath piece, because like that, there are so many other laws. But just talk about Sabbath today. And that will help us with everything else later on. Genesis chapter six, uh, Genesis chapter one, it says, God did the first day, the second day, the third day, the fourth day, the fifth day, the sixth day. And what did he do after the sixth day? He took rest. He took rest on the seventh day. And he took rest on the seventh day. But what happened on the day before that? On the sixth day? He created who? He, a lot of creation, but it was on the sixth day that he created Adam and Eve. So when Adam wakes up, the next day, he's walking into what? Rest. He's walking into Sabbath. For Adam, it was the first day of his week. For God did the work for six days, it's, you know, if I use the word work, did work for six days. On the seventh day, God took, took ceased from all of it. And, he, and what did he say? He used the word to end the completion of his six day creation. It says, uh, in, in Genesis, says he looked at his creation and he said, the last thing he created, who? Adam and Eve. And he said what? 
Very good. I always use the scripture for young married couples, which is God created the first day, it was good. Second day, it was good. The third day, it was good. Fourth day, was, it was just good. But after he gave Eve to Adam, he said, it's very good. So he was very happy that Adam had Eve, finally. Finally, he has a couple. So anyway, that was a digression. So he said, it's very good. God looked at this and completes the creation. He says, it's very good. And the next thing, so this shows what? He has completed his perfect. The context is perfection. He, com he completed it. It's perfect. And verse two, Genesis chapter 2 begins with, after he has completed, he said he took rest. Yeah. So for Adam and Eve, when they wake up, the next day, they're walking into rest. All right. Now this will connect there. Okay. So then, why did he give the law of Sabbath? Exodus chapter 20 verse 8 says, God made the Sabbath a law. Okay. We don't have time to go there. Pull it up if, uh, if, uh, the, uh, with um, Perry with zero experience is still doing a very good job of of pulling in and playing in for Jeremy this morning. Okay, so um, Sabbath became a, a law, became holy. Why? Because to keep it holy, by keeping it holy. Now, why did God make it a law? In another version, it's, uh, it says Sabbath became a law. Now, in Exodus chapter 31, this is, a, this is the verse I want to really bring it up here. Chapter 31, verse 12 and 13. <clears throat> Um, King James is good, yeah. Chapter 31, verse 12. Exodus. Exodus 12. So it says, Now the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, As for you, speak to the sons of Israel, saying, You must keep my Sabbath. Exodus 31, 12. You must keep my Sabbath, for chapter 31. For, for this is a sign. Okay. Say to the Israelites, and bring King James if you can, you must observe my Sabbath. This will be a sign. So remember two things. One, what did God say? This is a sign. Why is, what is the sign between me and you? for rest of the generations to come. And the next part of that verse, because I am the Lord that will keep you holy. I think NIV says keep you holy. I am the, or a, a new, uh, so I'm jumping between versions, but the point is two things, right? Keep the Sabbath, it's a law. And what is a Sabbath for? For well, this is a sign to let you know for generations to come, it is not you who's going to make you holy. I am the one who's going to make you holy. So what Ashish was saying. That is not by your efforts. Chris came up and said, I need Jesus. As much as you make an effort, I cannot do with my own effort. I need Jesus. This is a sign between me and the generations to come that it is not you who go, makes you holy. It is I will, who will make you holy. And, and, uh, <clears throat> That sign, if you look, God, this, by the way, this is, he's talking about the Ten Commandments. Honor thy father and mother, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill. All of those Ten Commandments, he does, God does never said that the commandment is a sign. It's only one commandment he says it's a sign between you and me, and it's about the Sabbath. And what is that? That you should keep it because it's a sign of you cannot make yourself holy, I will make you holy, okay? Between God and Israel. Now, <clears throat> um, the reason we have to understand that it is not my righteousness but God's is a simple analogy is, have you seen the athlete who runs and gets, or the, the footballer who scores the goal, how they celebrate? It's like, it's me who did it because he did it with his effort, right? The, the, he scored a goal, he's excited, and he is celebrating it of his efforts 
he's proud of it and he is he is he's in a jubilantly uh, enjoying the what he just did <clears throat> now it's coming from the fact that he put his effort you are going to be 100 proud of what you do if you did it yourself if i did a math test passed a math test with 100 marks I will be proud that I did this math because I was good at it, and I will look down at everyone else who has scored less than me, including the one who got only 99. I look down at him because he's still lesser than me. He could not do it as good as I did because it was me who did it. But suppose my teacher just decided to give me 100% even though I deserve only 50, and I know that. Will I be proud? I said, and I ask, oh, you got 100? Well, not me. I don't deserve this. My teacher, she was gracious to give me 100. It was not me. It's my teacher who gave it to me. And this is the sign of holiness in our lives. One who is holy is going to first say, the minute you're able to see another person and look down and, and look down at another person that he is not as righteous as me, or he's not, look at his clothing, look at his, how he thinks, look at his, his, uh, political affili affiliations, I'm just bringing this up because of politics, or look at what he is doing. If you start judging that person, only a proud person will be able to judge that. A person who is holy will say, I don't deserve this. The righteousness that I have, it's a sign, God reminds me that the righteousness I have is not me, it is God who is making me righteous. It is the Lord's, I humble myself before the Lord. I surrender my life to the Lord and it is his, grace over my life that is keeping me holy. The day I find myself that I did this certain holy act, the minute it gets into my head, I will begin to start to become proud because it is my accomplishment. I will do one of those things because I accomplished it. I scored the goal myself, right? So that's the attitude in which the Lord is reminding us, keep it holy. Now, I will show one more scripture before I wrap this up, right? <clears throat> See, there was a situation in the Old Testament because of this law that you should not work on Sabbath day. And it's, it was the one guy, he said, today's Sabbath, I'm not supposed to cook. I won't cook, but let me collect some wood for cooking tomorrow. <laughs> All he did was walk out of his house to collect some pieces of wood. I'm not cooking today, I'm cooking tomorrow. He collected wood to cook tomorrow. And somebody saw that and they went to Moses and said, hey, I saw this guy, he's working. He's not supposed to work. He's supposed to be sitting inside the house, not do any work. And they went to Moses and Moses said, this is, you know, this is a difficult situation. He's not supposed to even, he's not, you know, he did not cook, but he only collected wood. I mean, does he deserve to die? Because the commandment was that you will die if you do not follow the Sabbath, you ought to be killed. And they all got together and then finally asked the Lord and the Lord commanded to Moses, it says, put him to death. The poor guy, because he collected wood, he left the home to collect wood, was stoned to death. That's Old Testament law. So how many of us wants to be in the Old Testament? Thank God we are not in the Old Testament. Thank God we are not. The Lord came and brought grace into our lives to redeem us and give us righteousness that is beyond all Jewish religion, beyond all religion, beyond the Pharisees. He has given us a righteousness in him by trusting in his grace. And so we can try and try, but it will never make us holy. We can only become holy when we humbly go before him and ask the Lord to make us holy. Isaiah chapter 58, verse 13. If you bring that up, it says, if you turn away the foot from the Sabbath, from doing your pleasure on my holy day, the call the Sabbath a delight, the holy of the Lord honorable, and shall honor him, not doing thine own ways, nor finding thine own pleasure, nor speaking thine own words. Okay, let me just put it in simple words, this, this scripture that I just read. This is, the Lord is giving specific instructions about what do we mean by Sabbath to these people in Isaiah. It says, don't walk, or do any work, don't turn away their foot from the Sabbath, don't do anything that is pleasurely activities, but 
separate the day to honor the Lord and honor him. Don't do things for your own pleasure and don't even speak your, say any words. Just shut your mouth and sit. Just one day, he says. Just one day of the seven week, shut your mouth. Don't do any work. Keep quiet. All the other days, you want to yell at your wife? Go ahead, yell at your wife. Six days. You want to be angry, man? Six days, be angry. You want to lie? Six days, go ahead, keep lying. But one day, keep it holy. It's Sabbath. One day, please. Children of Israel, one day, keep it holy. All the other days, you can cheat, you can lie, you can do what you want to do. I'm just, of course, he didn't put it that way. I'm just giving, you see where I'm going with this. One day, don't even say a word. Just for one day, keep it holy, please. That was the commandment of Sabbath. The new covenant. Does this apply in the new covenant for us? All seven days, Sabbath applies for us. Not even one day. I would yell at my wife. Not even one day I want to yell, I want to say a lie. Not even one day I would I want to get angry at my coworker. Not even one day because each day the Lord has brought me to the Sabbath. It's a sign that it is not me who is doing it. It's the Lord's grace that is applying in my life on a Sabbath which is every day of my life. It is unfortunate that we it is sad that the mindset of the law has trickled in into the New Testament on certain things, and we have denominations like Seventh-day Adventists, denominations like thou shalt only wear white, denominations like thou shalt, only, thou shalt not wear certain attire or certain jewelry, the, not condemning anything, not judging anything, and making a point that becomes more important than living a life that is clear, or conscience is clear of judgment, of jealousy, of envy, of lying, of cheating, all of those things. Imagine if we observe Sabbath every moment of our day, how beautiful, how wonderful it will be our homes. How wonderful it will be children seeing parents observing Sabbath every moment. When there is a moment to argue, they are observing Sabbath. When there is a moment at workplace where you find yourself in a compromising situation, you choose not to compromise and not cheat. There, you're observing Sabbath. Imagine what kind of a witness you will be in that workplace. Without words, without thumping the Bible, your life will speak amazing words of Christ. Everyone ought to follow Sabbath. Not according to the way that we talked about, but that it's a sign, that it's the Lord's sign to us that he's going to keep us holy. Amen? With that in our hearts, let's enter into rest. Hebrews, it says, they could not enter into rest because of unbelief. Well, Sabbath means rest, right? Sabbath means rest. Everybody knows that. Everybody, uh, Sabbath means rest. So it connects further into Hebrews. It says, God stopped his own works. Why do you think God stopped? Because he got tired? You think God would get tired? Oh, I work for six days. I gotta be, it's too much work. Did God do that? No. He doesn't need, he doesn't get tired that he needed rest. It was to show us, to teach human beings to stop working and to enter into Sabbath. Don't make your effort to become righteous. Stop working to become righteous. Trust in God. Depend on him. Depend on his grace every moment. When there is a moment to so that we are facing offense, come under grace so that you can overcome that. Come under grace so you can overcome that. He's teaching rest. Hebrews chapter 4, 3 and 4 is all talking about entering into rest. And they could not enter. Who? The children of Israel could not enter into Canaan because of unbelief, it says. To have to have, to have faith that the Lord Grace is more than enough. I can enter into this rest. I can enter into this rest. Our opposition coming from all angles. That is the moment I can enter into this rest. I can be at rest. I can be at peace in my heart. And all else storm. Remember, Jesus could have commanded the storm immediately. But it took, he waited sleeping for the disciples to make an effort to call upon the name of the Lord. Salvation is free. But there is something you have to do. If somebody announced that 
free car at your local dealership by 6 o'clock, how will you get the car? First, you have to believe that there is, that, 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 there is a, that announcement is true, right? If you believe, then you will go there, and then you'll get the car. Salvation was free like that. But even though the car was free, there are two things you had to do. Believe and go. <laughs> Same is with holiness. If you came to salvation through faith, Galatians, Paul says, are you foolish? Galatians, you started in the spirit and came to Christ through faith, and now you're going to earn your righteousness through works? Galatians chapter 2, we were, we were there a few, a few minutes earlier. Now you're going to do it through works? You're foolish to do that. If God could bring you to salvation just by faith, can he not bring you into holiness by the same faith? So let us not be weary and afraid and scared that I need to follow these laws in order to become righteous. Come into the new covenant. Come into the reality of the grace of Jesus Christ. Come into this place where we can be in rest in the Lord, not striving to overcome, but resting in the Lord. Amen. Now we will go for communion. Brother Bravo will lead us. Praise the Lord. The Lord has, has spoken to us through a different brothers and sisters. For me, the meeting starts with the opening prayer and the hymns are very important. The memory verses are very important. And every word that is spoken, it is spoken to bless and edify one another. And about the rest, in the book of Hebrews chapter 4, brother was referring to it, there remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For anyone who enters God's rest also rest from his own work. Uh, I'm glad you are here. Can you pull up that song, I Stand Amazed? Yeah, I'll refer to that. I was looking for you. Good. I Stand Amazed. So, for anyone who enters God's rest also rest from his own work, just as God did from his. Let us therefore, now this is the, this is important, right? God has ordered. Now, compared to what he has done, what we had to do is so little. Dealership is offering the car. But if you say that dealership is fake, and if you sit here, and then, when Ashish comes with a new car, what is the difference? One acted upon faith. The other one did not act upon faith. The one who received two talents, he acted upon faith, and thereby he had two more talents. The one who received one talent did not act upon it, and therefore the master was not pleased. So let us therefore make every effort to end that rest, so that no one will fall by following their example of disobedience. The people of Israel did not enter the promised land, not because God was not able. He was very able. Yet, they could not enter. Why? Because of their disobedience. And disobedience comes when you don't believe. Right? If the if you know the dealership, if Chris McGough will say, Baba, come take away my car, I would go with him. I know he will honor his word, right? But if somebody I see on the street and say, come with me, I'm going to give you a nice car, I'll be foolish to follow him. But our Lord has done all that we need. All what we need to do is to enter into that trust by faith, not by works, lest any man should boast. Obedience is required of us. It is not a ticket for all. It is not free for all. It is for children. 
it is a children's bread that the Lord will give it to us. So I thank God. And now, one thing Ashish said is when you go through the desert, two things can happen. What did he say? When we go, when you go through the desert, Psalm 63, he, he said, Ashish said, two things can happen. And, and he quoted Charles Spurgeon. Ashish, come to help me. And what did Charles Spurgeon say about when you go through the desert experience? Right. Is that right, Ashish? What did you say? Right. If you go through the wilderness and if you praise God, then you have the strength to overcome. Otherwise, the desk you become, your experience make you dried up in your faith, right? So that is what the devil wants you to do. Look what did God do. You deserve better. And then what do we say? Get behind me. Say it and for all things work together for good. For all things work together for good to them that love God and call according to His. My Father knows what is best for me. How blessed our children would be if they were to say, My Father knows, my mother knows, I want to obey. And all the trouble that we have is because we have such a rebellious heart. Sin has brought rebellion first to God and to every authority. Anything that we say, don't do it. Why? Why? Why can't we do it? That's a fallen nature, rebellious nature. May God help us that we will not be rebellious because God has done all things. Jesus said, what did Jesus say? It is finished. What, does, what was finished? Your salvation, the work that needed to be done for your salvation is complete. He did it all. He paid the price that I could never pay. It took all my sins away. Now, when we are going to take communion, this, uh, can you pull that song? I, I stand amazed as we were singing that song. See, what are we doing in communion? One of the first things that you need to do is to think of what Jesus has done. We must stand amazed. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me a sinner, condemned, unclean. That's what communion is. Communion is to remember what the Lord has done, that he has died for my sins. I stand in wonder how he could love me a wretched sinner as me. See, sometimes we forget that. We think of our own righteousness and we become Pharisees. Think that Jesus died for somebody else. No, I am good. I come from a good family. I haven't done any of those ten commandments. I didn't disobey any ten commandments and all sorts of self-righteousness. But when we take communion, Lord, I am the one who is standing in need. I stand amazed. In the presence of Jesus and Nazarene, and wonder how he could love me a sinner, condemned and clean. Next answer. Oh, how marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. See, what should be our song? Not our righteousness, not what we have done, but my Savior's love for me, and that is not when you take communion the communion we take to because it is part of fellowship part of koinonia you know when we come together we honor god we remember together but the communion is an unbroken fellowship with the lord and that communion is every moment of our life walking with jesus there is nothing now to fear i am walking with jesus when you walk you know your face should shine not because you are acting up or you are, you are having theater, but you know, people will look at you and say, there goes a man who is, something is special about him. What is it that makes you happy? What? I remember what the Lord has done. And that's what? He took my sins and my sorrows and he made them his very own 
and bore the burden of Calvary and suffered and died alone. Amen. And when with the ransomed in glory, his face I at last shall see, it will be my joy through the ages to sing of his love. So, it's not only that he died, but we also remember this great hope that and when with the ransomed in glory his face I at last shall see the resurrection hope that he died our Savior is not a dead one he died he was broken for our sin but then he rose up hallelujah he arose hallelujah and therefore we also have this hope what is it that when with the ransomed in glory his face I at last shall see it will be my joy through the ages to sing of his love for me. See, this is the life of a Christian. A Christian is, is bubbling, it is bubbling, it is bubbling in my heart. I'm singing, I'm dancing, I'm praising. What a blessed assurance Jesus has done. He has done all that we need. And we no longer need to be alone in this world. And anything that this world can offer pales in, compa in, in, in comparison it's all the pleasures of sin is for a moment but when you live as Jesus lived on this earth what would Jesus do then every day we go from glory to glory so communion is an expression Lord I want your life to flow through every day every moment walking with Jesus there is nothing now to fear so let us read from 1st Corinthians chapter 11 verse 23 onwards this in a way summarizes that there are two aspects of it that one is that Jesus died for our sins and then he's coming back for us amen 1st Corinthians chapter 11 verse 23 onwards for I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you the Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks he broke it and said this is my body which is for you do this in remembrance of me so when we eat this bread and when we drink this cup we do this in remembrance of him there is nothing magical about this bread there is nothing magical about this there is no transubstantiation, cause substantiation, nothing like that. This is, it is a piece of bread that we brought. It is a piece of bread now. It is a piece of bread even as we partake of it. But we do this in remembrance of what Christ has done for us. Amen. This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way after supper he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death. Right? We proclaim that Jesus, I stand amazed in the presence of God. That we proclaim that he died for me a sinner, condemned and unclean. And not only that, we do this until he comes, which is that when with the ransomed in glory, I shall stand with him. I'll see him as he is. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. A man ought to examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many among you are weak and sick and a number of you have fallen asleep. But if we judge ourselves, we would not come under judgment. When we are judged by the Lord, we are being disciplined so that we will not be condemned with the world. So then, my brothers, when you come together to eat, that's enough. Verse 32 is. So shall we... Now, the communion in itself is, you know, like uh, in the Hindu culture and all, there's always this idea that anything that is from the church or the, from the temple, if you take something special, it's going to happen to you. So sadly, just this last week, 
four ladies, including a doctor from Australia, came to Kerala, a Hindu temple, one big temple. And they were so consumed by getting something from the temple, they stole one of the little uh, something from there. You know, that is used for offering or something. You know, and then now they four are going to be in jail. Now, why did they steal, do you think? Why do you think this? Huh? They wanted to get a blessing from the temple, so they carried a tumbler or a glass or something. And they hid it, and now they are going to be in jail. Now, there is no such thing about this. So don't think that you're going to be not blessed because you have not taken communion. Communion is for those who have accepted the Lord as their personal savior and have obeyed the Lord in the waters of baptism and are living a separated life. Not that we are prone to sin, but whenever my little children do not commit sin, but if you do, we get right with God. Amen. And that the communion is not for perfect people, but those who have come to accept Jesus as their savior and walking in truth, have a good conscience towards God and good conscience towards others. So there is no condemnation if you are not taking communion, but ask the Lord to set our life right so that we can also be partakers of the communion of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So all those who have accepted the Lord as a personal savior and have taken water baptism and are walking in fellowship with the Lord and with the children of God, they can take communion. So when the communion is brought to you, you if you are not in that place, no condemnation. Please don't take it. Amen. All right. And others are welcome to take. And would you like a duty to stand here? Yeah. Okay. Let's all stand up and let's pray. Let's pray. Let's pray. Father, we thank you and praise you for this blessed time that you have given us. The words of eternal life you have spoken to us throughout this year, O oh Lord. Now, Father, I pray as we partake of this communion that we will all be amazed at what Christ has done for us personally, Lord to save as such a wretched and unclean person as I. And now, Lord, with a great hope that you, Jesus is coming back for a bride without spot or wrinkle, we partake of this communion. Bless the element. Bless the brothers and sisters. In Jesus' precious name. Amen. Please, let's distribute.
Chapter 22, verse 19. And he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's all partake of the bread. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood is poured out for you. Let's partake of the cup. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. He took my sins and my sorrows. fellowship meal for everyone and especially the visitors can go first and I believe they are ready right there by the kitchen uh, so it's a blessing and spend time with each other. Amen. God bless you all. Amen. Praise the Lord. Uh, Brother Victor, can you pray for the food? <laughs> 